Welcome to the IPX True North podcast, where we connect people, processes, and tools. Well, hello, everyone, today. Uh, my name is Brandy Taylor. I am the Vice President of Services for IPX, which is the Institute for Process Excellence. And today, I am very pleased to be joined by the lovely Rachel Bartholomew, who is the founder of High IV Health. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for meeting up. It's super fun to have you here with me today. So um, just a little bit, um, uh, High IV's mission is to provide a three-in-one pelvic rehabilitation system, which is a connected smart pelvic rehab system, provides a device, an app, and clinician software, creating real-time information to give you the most comfortable and informed experience through your pelvic health recovery. <laughs> and I know that was a, a big mouthful for me, but I thought it was best just to, to read exactly um, what exactly it is. So, um, you know, I guess uh, if, if there's anything else you'd like to share there about your company, you know, we'll, we're going to get into this here pretty deep here, but um, just as a, as a quick intro. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's subsequently what it is. Uh, so pelvic rehab, specifically for hypertonic pelvic floor, which I'm sure we'll get into. Um, and yeah, really having uh, this remote patient monitoring that we do in cardiology to respiratory, uh, to diabetes, but having a similar function uh, at home for women. And so uh, going through their, their pelvic recovery. So having a device used from home by the patient, having it monitored by the clinician from their office. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So, you know, I guess for starters, um, and I'm sure you probably get this a lot, but you're a pretty cool woman. I would love to say something <laughs> a little more strong, but um, but I'm just gonna keep it uh keep it comfy here. So I I just, you know, I when I was asked to look into you and your company, I, I mean it's it's really hard not to be instantly drawn to your story, to your motivation. Um, you know, and it's, I guess at this point, it sounds cheesy, but I'll consider myself a little fangirl. Um, so <laughs> I'll definitely be keeping my eye on your success as you progress through your journey. So, um, so it, it's a pleasure to, to spend the time with you. And, um, you know, I'm always a sucker for strong women. So looking forward to see how you succeed and, and thrive in these technical areas. So. Yeah, thank you. I mean, geez, I wasn't expecting such flattery. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you. <laughs> okay. You know, I guess um, just to get started, I'd love, you know, and, and I know I, I've heard it a number of times um, from, from my research, but just for those who, you know, we have, a, have a, maybe a unique group here that, that hasn't heard your story, if you, you know, who may be new to your company, would you like to just give a brief, you know, summary? Um, what is your spiel? What's your, you know, your history of how you got here and why? Yeah, it's an interesting story. Uh, I come from a family of entrepreneurs, so that spirit was always in me. Um, I did my undergrad in business, and then I did my master's in entrepreneurship. I didn't want to do an MBA. Um, I was like, I, there's no way I'm going to do case studies. I want to do something that's really hands on and you know, immerses me into applying the concepts. And really, that is entrepreneurship and, and starting a company. And so my master's program actually in the first week told me to go out and uh, create a five minute pitch on just anything. And it was given to us very last minute. I spent about three minutes panicking and then two minutes actually creating a pitch. <laughs> and I just leveraged what I knew at the time, which was automotive. I was like living, breathing, eating, sleeping, racing uh, cars and motorcycles. And um, yeah, just pitched a company, which became my first company called The Mod Market. And we did augmented reality e-commerce for aftermarket automotive. So everyone's like, what is that? Uh, essentially, it's like 3D um, interaction, kind of like Need for Speed, the video game, but in real life. Um, and it was my first company that I spent about five years on. I had lots of up and ups and downs. I do a little like comedic. Uh, presentation to students about how much I messed up on that company and how much not to mess up like I did. Um, <laughs> but it was such a learning journey for me because I got through a lot of those growing pain things that you need to get through to become an entrepreneur. Um, and so I exited that company. It wasn't beautiful, but it was something. Um, and it was a great learning process. And I said to myself, I am not going to start a company in the next year. Um, I failed at that miserably. We'll talk about that. But um, 
I essentially went back to the workforce. I worked running a campus linked accelerator. So it's an incubator for startups or run by students. And it was at Wilfrid Laurier University up here in Canada. I did that for a year. I was like kind of bored and wanted to go on to the next thing uh, as any entrepreneur or business person who doesn't settle for anything. Uh, and I left that job and two weeks later in uh, April, 2019, I got a cervical cancer diagnosis. And so um, obviously you don't plan for these things to happen. Uh, and it kind of swept me off my feet. I spent a year uh, in and out of treatment and, you know, doing everything that I need to do to focus on what was fighting this thing that was killing me. Um, so I had my surgery within about a month and a half. It was really quick. Uh, I was on bed rest and my body was kind of disconnected from my mind. My mind was going hundred miles per hour. And as somebody who always needs to be doing something, uh, not having a job, not having anything to do, but to rest, which in hindsight kind of makes sense that my body and, um, you know, being sick, uh, and, and being a person that just doesn't want to take rest kind of is the irony there is hilarious, but I, uh, I spent my time connecting with women who had went through this before. And we have lovely Facebook groups and a bunch of social media groups that just connect and kind of share their experience. And I started reaching out to them. I started collecting this information of um, products that they were using and the aftercare process after cancer. And it was very eye-opening in terms of how much women were suffering like you think you go through treatment you think you're going out the other end and you're screaming and you're like i'm done hooray and like the world's your oyster and it's really not that process at all it's this five-year process afterwards there's a lot of symptoms it's almost worse than the treatment itself and so um i started looking into it i actually had pelvic health issues 11 years prior to that uh, and had seen one of the only pelvic floor therapists within like two hours of my area. Um, so it just shows you how little this had been adopted at the time and was given this lovely, beautiful product, which is called a vaginal dilator. And essentially what this is, is it's a bunch of sticks on a handle. Um, and it was created in 1938. And God bless the man who made it because he made something. So I was like, okay, I hated this when I first used it 11 years prior. And this was the only option for me. And 11 years later, with a completely different diagnosis, she comes out of the closet and out of the drawer and wipe the dust off and I have to use it again. And as I dug into it, the women hated it. They said it was cold, hard, mechanical. They didn't like it. Um, and it has only about a 30% adherence rate. So it is really, really not well, you know, uptaked. Subsequently, when I went through my process with my doctors, um, they ended up going, are you using a vaginal dilator on a checklist? Yes or no. And that was all I got in terms of what I'm supposed to be doing after my treatment. So it just shows you the disconnect and the education and that hands-on ability. And I was like, okay, I'm an innovator. I can do this. Like I can take this on. Um, I started framing out what I would want from a product. I started gathering data from these women of what they would expect from a product more indirectly. So not really just saying, Hey, creating a product. What do you think? It was, what have they told off the cuff through their experiences through these posts? Uh, and I started my radiation treatments. And so in radiation, you're full time in um, the cancer center every single day. And it was the perfect opportunity for me to talk to doctors. Um, I could corner them. They had to take care of me anyway. So it's like, well, they might as well listen to my pitch. <laughs> So um, I was uh, being lined up under the radiation machine and, and pitching my company to the radiologist at the time who I love him. God bless him. He uh, he's now him and my oncologist are involved in clinical trials that we're doing. But um, they essentially said, 
this is an area that we know needs to improve. We don't know how to improve it. We need someone to improve it. Uh, I got called into my oncologist's office to talk about it. Um, and the rest was really history from there. I knew I had the patient validation in combination with the clinical validation that I needed that to know that I had something to go off of and to build off of from there. Um, and thus, High Ivy was born. Wow, it's amazing. It's 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 such a whirlwind is as the only word that comes to mind because this happened in 2019, correct? Is when this journey started for you. So um so everyone else in the world has been dealing with a pandemic and how to survive that. And um and and, and you've been basically revolutionizing uh you know, in uh, an industry in some ways. And so it just it's a it's amazing. And um I love how you've channeled that energy into something really productive because um that's not an easy thing to do for for many. So um, you know, I guess besides being an innovator, it's super clear that that you're a motivator and an influencer maybe not even intentionally, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun. And, and you, you turn it into something positive as, as much as you can. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I don't think you have to be subject to pelvic health concerns specifically to relate to you and, and to your company and, and the story that you just shared, you know, I mean, um, I think, you know, the more you talk about it, I think everyone you speak with has some sort of story or it's really common to have 100%. some sort of a story. And, you know, even I have Hashimoto's. And so it's a it's, it's a pretty common thing. Um, it's a form of hypothyroidism. Um, but it's also an issue that's difficult to understand. And everyone's experience is different, you know, just just like any other kind of autoimmune diseases where treatment often has to be taken into your own hands, right? You got to figure out what you need and 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 be your own advocate and in and, and that. So, um, you know, I think that that it's just there's just so much to to resonate, I guess, uh, with with your experience and and all that. And I guess you know, just for thinking about you know if if, if there's any other health related problems that can be motivated from your experience, you know, I, 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 is there anything else, other related things that you'd like to, to highlight that might get people's ear here to say, hey, I, you know what, I need to think about this and take this into my own hands as well? A hundred percent. And so now, you know, I've noticed more than anything that this pelvic health world, I feel like I've unlocked a conspiracy theory because majority women have come in contact with it in some sort of capacity, but yet we've just kind of rolled over and, and assumed that this is what we should accept. And so part of it, it's funny you say Hashimoto's. I actually started a podcast called White Court Warriors. Um, we did our first season and I actually recorded it during my cancer treatment. So I talk about what I'm going through as I'm going through my cancer treatments. And we talked to somebody with Hashimoto's and we talked to a number of different people who get a diagnosis or have some sort of symptoms and go to their doctors and they're turned down and turned down and turned down and they're getting answers that just don't make sense. That's right. And they're like, all right, screw this. I am going to take it into my own hands and I am going to try to make a change. And whether that was starting a company, writing a book, um, I, the girl with Hashimoto's that I, I interviewed, she went to legislation to try to fight for drugs uh, for this, this group, right? So how do we just as people in general not rule over to what we think is an authoritarian figure in a doctor and say, no, that's not the answer I'm looking for. I need to know. I'm not just going to accept that. And how do we start to talk and be more comfortable about talking about these things? Um, because I think majority of people listening probably have had someone in their realm go through these types of things. And so it's not uncommon. Um, and I think we just need to figure out how to make it better to talk about these types of situations. Okay, so now I'm going to dive into maybe a little more meaty topic, something a little deeper. Um, you know, and it, it, you think about medical devices and regulations come to mind. So, um, you know, I guess I'd like to just, you know, talk a little bit about the FDA um, and really what does that mean to a consumer, right? And we can talk about it in the general sense um, because I think everyone's aware that the medical industry is, is super high in regulation um, and this is a good thing, right? It provides some level of comfort for consumers who, uh, who, don't, who don't know, right? It's some level of safety there. Um, I think many consumers 
believe that an FDA approval stamp means that the product is safe and effective. And I know I was one of those people who think that, you know, that's something that, you know, without doing your research, that's what you think. So I guess I would love to get your take is, do you feel that that is, that that's accurate based on your research? Oh gosh. So this is a can of worms that I have been struggling with myself. Um, I think, okay, before I go to the consumer side and kind of how that plays into the way that consumers pick up products, um, I'll kind of go through my experience of, of from the company side and what I've seen in relation to the market. So we made a decision early on and it was not an easy decision and I'm challenged on it every day um, from investors, from everybody as to do you go direct to consumer with no FDA or Health Canada or MDR or whatever regulatory body it is coverage on your device? Or do you go down that pathway, which is long, is costly, is very rigorous, is time consuming? <laughs> it's not very attractive from a business perspective, per se, when it comes to investing money into something that is extending your timeline out to go to market right yeah. with your product yeah. yeah and you get through these moral dilemmas of like i would have investors come to me going why aren't you just creating a product that you can sell like hotcakes and get out there and like screw the red tape like why would you want to go through that process when you could just make money and it's like okay well why are you saying this do you want a, a fast return on your investment is that what you're looking for because if that's the case then we're not aligned yeah. because when i think about what is direct to consumer and now i'm gonna unlock a uncomfortable area that is a hot topic now in this world of femtech which is you know female women's health specific technologies is a lot of products in this space go the direct to consumer route because it's easier, it's less costly, there's less red tape, and you can get to market faster. But what that creates is products that are considered general wellness because they cannot make medical claims. Um, some of them, it, it's a gray area, and a lot of them will, or some of them will bridge that gap and kind of make claims that you're like, you should probably not be saying that. Um, but it's kind of this, this hazy area. And unfortunately, with pelvic health specifically, um, we fall under because it goes into the vagina, sex toys. Yeah. And so a lot of companies will go under this sexual wellness, it's not so much sex toys, because they don't want to be considered that but sexual wellness. And when you go that direction, what happens is a lot of these products don't go through the rigor of safety, efficacy, understanding what that truly means and what it means to make a product that a user can use without any repercussions to it. And I have most of our industry has unfortunately went that direction in the pelvic health world. There are some that have picked up and kind of pulled up their socks and said, I'm not going to do that. And now it's starting to come to light more and more. And when I started doing research into these companies, uh, we actually created like our own grading system and everything. I found companies that were using FDA registered, FDA approved materials, FDA approved facilities that we are creating our product in. Does a consumer understand what any of that means? I know that I didn't. No. If somebody works in the space, maybe if you do your own research, most definitely, you know, or you kind of have a vague understanding, but the majority of patients or consumers um, are going to look at that and go, oh, this is safe. This is FDA. But meanwhile, registered approved materials and approved facilities have nothing to do with the product that you're holding on to and them actually going through the rigor of making sure it's safe. And so this has caused like huge strife because it's a lot of, I call it pseudoscience. Um, there's others that call it like fake fraudulent science. Um, I, I, I wouldn't go that far per se, um, but it's definitely something that, you know, can dupe a consumer. And 
if you're willing to go that direction as a, as a company, what else are you willing to do? And we've seen some companies in our space that like falsify reviews. They're making claims that are very medical. And it's like, do you really know what you're saying? And I think my favorite is like results in 15 days. Sure, it's results, but if you're working with muscles and tissues, those things change over time. It's a roller coaster ride. I know my my ride has been very much a roller coaster, and I'm sure others are as well. This isn't something that it's like a, a fixed band aid. And what we see is a lot of the the patients that we've talked to um, that have bought these products it goes into a drawer and it stays there because they're not seeing the results. They're not understanding the true reason why that product exists in the first place. There's a lot of science behind it that doesn't make any sense. It hasn't went through proper trials and hasn't went through proper clinical evidence. And so when it comes to the FDA, it is, it's unfortunate because they're also so tied up in their resources and which what fights and battles do they do they fight, right? Uh, if there's companies out there that are claiming they're FDA approved and they really aren't, and there are a bunch in this space and I will throw that out there. Um, it's up to the consumer to kind of take that into their hands and do that research. And it's not a fun thing to research either. Like it's very yeah. confusing. I know for me, it was such a learning experience to go down that pathway and make that decision. Um, but when I think about it, I'll sum up my points with this. When I think about it from me as a consumer and having cervical cancer, and if it's science related and it's my body and it's like, I want to know that something is going to be recommended by my doctor and it's going to be taken seriously um, and it's going to be safe for me after going through such a traumatic experience. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I think that that's a very good uh, way to, to sum it up. You know, I, so I, you know, just after speaking with you the first time, you know, I did a little, it's very confusing out there. And I did a little looking just to just get a, a, you know, kind of a cursory look for my own self. And, and according to the FDA website, you know, and this is quote, FDA approval means that the benefit outweighs potential risks for the intended population. So that's what they state. Yeah. So um, it's just, I think it's interesting and I think it's important to know that and understand what that means. Think about that. Absor- absorb it. But, um, and then I saw a, a 2016, which I know is a little bit old at this point, but um, a Brigham and Women's Study surveyed doctor understanding of FDA approval. Um, so two interesting pieces of detail here resulted from that study. Um, 73% of physicians think that the FDA only approves new drugs or products if they're at least as good as existing drugs or products. This is incorrect. So I think that's in, that's interesting, right? I mean, even some of our physicians have, are, are, are lacking a little bit of understanding of what this means, right? Or, and what they should recommend. Um, another statistic came out of this one was 70% of physicians think, again, incorrectly, that the FDA approves drugs based on clinically meaningful benefits. Yep. So that's, it's just, you know, I think it's, again, it's, 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 you know, and I get it, you know, that it's, it's, you should always take, take your own research into your own hands. You should always learn, like, don't just, you know, trust uh, these, these, these experts are trying to make the best calls and try to advise you in the best way, but that should never replace your own understanding and your own research. And so um, I just think it's a, it's, it's interesting piece of discussion. You know, I think only certain products really undergo a very stringent approval process by the FDA. Um, and, and even the products that are approved are not always guaranteed to be safe and effective for everybody. So, um, again, just, you know, just just be aware and, and be mindful of these things, I think. Right. So, um, you know, another, the other other piece of information I saw was just because um, you know, the FDA has approved something um, you know, that doesn't mean that they're going, they don't have to, or they're not necessarily going to go and routinely monitor companies who use the stamp on the products. So, um, so that's another thing for people to be aware of. So, um, you know, and, and I guess let's bring it back to medical devices in general, which vary in terms of importance and risk, obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's a big range here. They fall somewhere in the middle 
of the FDA's approval spectrum. So I guess I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, the, the classification strategies and, and what do those classifications mean and, 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 and what, what else is there that, that, that our listeners could, could be interested in learning more about? Yeah, so I, I will preface that I am no by no means an FDA or regulatory expert. I'm actually learning this process as I'm going. Um, and it's been an interesting process to learn about because I initially thought that the FDA was uh, about clearing products that were clinically effective. And the definition of what clinically effective means is such a gray area and a spectrum. And learning about that is, it's an eye-opening process. The whole process of this is very eye-opening. I think one of the things I, I mentioned to you about watching is the bleeding edge on Netflix. Yeah. It yeah. is the craziest um, experience about learning about what the FDA will put through Um and at what cost and what are the motivations behind it? And I'm realizing as I go through this process that a lot of this stuff is business strategy. It's not so much about clinical evidence per se. And, you know, it, it goes into reimbursement strategies. It goes into like insurance and all of these things that you don't think about when you think about the FDA and why people or, or companies and products choose the pathways they go down. Um in terms of the, the classification strategy that we're kind of muddling in, so you've got the class ones, it's essentially a registration. Um, it does not have any rigor behind it, it has no clinical evidence, it has uh, really no safety uh, behind it. It's just kind of registering your product under them. Um, you have class two, and this is where a lot of the medical devices will lay, uh, unless it is higher risk which goes into class three. And essentially that's something that'll be used inside the body, in surgeries, in some of these high risk situations. But a lot of devices fall into this class two category. And you live in this world of the 510K and it's either under predicates or it's under what's called a de novo process. And under predicates, which is what a lot of companies will use, is you go through an argument that you are the same or similar or what they call substantially equivalent to products that have already gotten clearance in the FDA. And this is kind of what the, the bleeding edge talks about is all these products that got this clearance um, just to make kind of a next step further to say that you have this, this clearance. But at the same time, when you talk about doctors, I also found out that doctors aren't necessarily supposed to recommend products that are not FDA approved. Mm, okay. So to get that next level of your business model, which is not consumer, but having a doctor backing your product or recommending your product legally and for the liability reasons, they want to have that FDA approval process on it. Right. Mm -hmm. The easiest pathway is to go through the 510k. And that's not a bad thing. It's not, it's, it's there because there's products that have done similar functions that have sub hopefully submitted clinical evidence at first um, that you just baseline all of your safety testing off of and everything else. And you say, I'm equivalent to this product. We're looking at a multiple predicate strategy under that um, just to get through the process of getting our product through market so that then we can start to apply in the de novo side. Now, we don't know if the FDA will accept that. You go th through something called a pre-sub meeting um, where the de novo strategy is you actually have to put forward clinical evidence and clinical evidence that follows a strict standard. Um, and so in combination of that plus the predicate side, we know that even if we were to expand our label use, essentially what you're applying for is to have your product used for a specific group of people or patients for specific symptoms, for specific um, diagnoses and situations. If you want to build out beyond that, you have to apply clinical evidence to it if it never existed before. So okay. for instance, for us, our product would fall under the painful sex or vaginismus uh, predicates. 
if we want to expand into endometriosis, we have to submit for our, clini our clinical trial data and expand that label. So okay. that's what essentially we're trying to do. If the FDA decides, no, 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 you're not going to do that. We want you to go to the de novo pathway. It's a very long pathway where you have to go through that rigor of the, the, the clinical trial submissions um, and analyzing the data. Was it high powered enough? Was it structured in the right way? Did you collect the right data? And does that really uh, support the indication for use you're trying to get? On the, the consumer side, really in reality, if you're being given a product that's FDA approved, going into the FDA database, finding that product and looking at the indication for use is what you should be doing. Because that indication for use is going to tell you what what patients can use that product. And if you're not listed there, then mm, there's a big risk there because it's not technically what the label is telling you it can be used for. Hmm. So this is where it gets all hazy. Um, and often companies will go through that 510k predicate pathway just to get through. Um, but is it without the rigor and oversight that it should have and monitoring adverse effects and um, patients who have adverse effects to the point where it hurts them and to the point that it they file a complaint with the FDA or the doctor files a complaint with the FDA. How does that process get taken into consideration um, is something that you know, I think the FDA has limited resources in what they can and cannot do. Subsequently, if you see a product out there that is doing something they shouldn't be and you file um, for that, they will say, okay, well, is this really a low hanging fruit that we should go after? And is it worth our time and our resources and our money to try to shut this company down and get them to change their ways? Certainly. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah. it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to learn about. Um, and the business motivations behind the pathways that are taken, let alone when it should just be about, is this clinically relevant? And is it safe, I think should be really what the process should be for companies. But yeah, it's been done the same way for so many years now. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 I understand that. So you know, I guess that's a lot of inf interesting things for people to learn about. And I'm thinking um, if anyone's listening at this point that is thinking about how do I look into something, you know, and I think you, you already highlighted that is, is the FDA website has something where you can actually go in and look at. Is there how is, is there any other resources that are out there people to look into um, something specific to maybe something that they're being prescribed to use? Yeah, I've had a bunch of patients come to us as well. Unfortunately, the FDA does not um, talk about cases that are open um, unless they're closed and an action was kind of taken from that. Yeah. Um, so you're not really going to know what's going on. But if you see a product that claims are FDA approved, you can go on, on the FDA website. There's actually a FDA.report or something like that website uh, where you can just quickly search this stuff and see what the indications for use are, see if they're even cleared for use to begin with and what that classification is. Um, you know, if it's class one, it's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but know that that can't, they cannot use medical claims for any specific medical condition or, or symptom, right? Uh, it's kind of general overall satisfaction and wellness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as you go into the class two side, that's where you start in class three, that's where you got get to see some of those um, claims being made. And you can look into their clinical trial data. I mean, it's, it's sometimes tough to read, but you know, read the abstract and scroll down to the conclusion. And often they'll be stated in a very clear way where it says what really happened. And oftentimes you'll see, I know we've seen it is that there's a lot of companies out there that do clinical trials that fail. I mean, I, we could be one of them down the road. I don't know yet uh, how that's, we never know until it finishes up, but um, how did those things happen and did they fail? And if they failed, they can't use that data right? It, it's yeah. good to inform the next steps, but it yeah. can't be used in, the, in an application side. So you can dig into that. Um, the FDA commissioners will actually put out 
Um, and this is a huge thing in our area around the lasers and RF technologies for uh, vaginal use. Uh, they will actually put out uh, warnings and they will say, don't use products like this for X, Y, Z, and it's not proven out and these types of things. So uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can kind of do just through basic kind of company name, product name, FDA, enter, see what Google tells you okay. um, from there. All right. Very good. Yeah. And, and it's not to say we, we know there's lots of really good things that are happening, right? Yeah. The process. There, there's, there's good reason this is here. And, and they're also, um, you know, have to pick and choose and, and try to help people get things to market. And so having a fit for purpose approach and how they do that makes a lot of sense. So it's just also being educated on on what you purchase and, and what you're going to use it for and, and just learn what you need to learn about it. Um, yeah. And, you know, if, and again, like yourself, if you question something, when when the heck was this thing designed? You know, um, there could be opportunities out there. If you're questioning it, there's probably good reason. So yeah. just a couple more. How about a couple fun questions here for closing? So um, what's right. the, what's the hardest part of forming your startup? Besides, obviously, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the reason Besides the reason I'm thinking more of forming the company. Does it is there a hardest part in your perspective? Okay, like, I mean, choosing medical is pretty obvious. We've talked about that. And that's, that's not for everybody. Yeah. When we think of startup from every single possible startup out there, it's managing people. It's people. That's all a business is, is managing people and expectations and the way they want to be managed and leading them. And how do you lead them? And how do you make success? And how do you define success? And how do they define success in their roles working with you, right? That's all it ever is, is just dealing with people. And every single person in your company will have a different expectation. Yeah. And how do you manage that? Yeah. You can only do so much. And then, you know, you, you'll have to have kind of those ways that you go back and forth with them to make sure that they're happy enough that they stay with you and they believe in what you're doing and um, can get through some of the tough times with you because yeah. startup is not easy and there's a lot of tough times. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's a really good answer because people can make or break everything, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. and I know, and I know your journey is not finished. You still have lots left to, yet to come here. Um, so maybe it's okay. a little premature to ask this one, but what is the best part of your journey so far? Has there been any, something that's just been really exciting or really motivational for you? There's kind of two things. I think first is kind of when you talk to patients and you like unlock all of these things that you know that, um, you'll hopefully be able to help with, or at least, you know, you create this kind of trust with your consumer, your patient that you're just like, this is, this is great. Um, I think that's a big piece of it. I think the best part is just also, I guess, kind of comes back to working with the people. Like we become this big family. We go through the ups and downs together. Everybody has their own ways of handling things, which really helps me. And so I, I, connect with my team about everything and maybe I shouldn't but I do um and it's just they're the ones who kind of get me through all the crazy stuff that happens from the CEO level as well mm -hmm. um so I think that like equally the people side of it is also the best part of it if that can make sense at all I think it does um, you know you got your your mission together you guys are fighting yeah. together you're working through things together and yeah. whether it's the good and the bad it's all you know coming together and forming good relationships and and purpose 100%. right yeah and I guess because your first question wasn't what's the worst part it's the hardest, hardest. Part. That's right. <laughs> and so you know just because it's the hardest doesn't mean it's not the best. And I think the best things that you do can often be the hardest things that you go through. So fully yeah. agree with that. I think that's absolutely yeah. accurate. So, yeah. okay. Well, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, there's lots of interesting discussion we had today. What if people want to follow you on your journey? What's the best way for them to kind of see what you're up to and, and where high IV is uh, with their journey? Yeah, so we have uh, our website, we are overhauling it. But once it's overhauled, it's still going to be relatively the same. Um, subscribe to our newsletter on highiv.com. Uh, we're also recruiting focus groups. So any woman or a clinician that's working in this space can sign up, we do pay um, for people to give us feedback and talk with us and share things about their journeys. Um, so please, if you're open to that, 
you know, jump on and, and sign up. I'd love that. Uh, we do have, you know, 20 minute, 15 minute conversations on an interview. So I'll get to meet you one-on-one -on -one if you're listening. Um, and if you don't want a newsletter or to sign up for focus groups at high Ivy health on Twitter, Instagram, you can follow white coat warriors. I'm hoping to do a second season. Um, and if you just want to chat with me, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Excellent. Now, you already asked, you got my last question, Zane, if someone <laughs> wanted to reach out to you directly in case they just had any specific questions or, or any opportunities with you. So uh, LinkedIn is yeah. the best way then. Okay, excellent. Yes. All right. Anything else that you'd like to share with anyone? I think we covered a ton, Rachel. So thank you so much for your time today. Of course, of course. No, nothing else to share. Just be your own authority in your health and do your research and don't accept no as an answer. I like it. All right. Thanks so much, Rachel. Take care. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe and review the show. And for more information on IPX, visit IPXHQ.com.